So we are in a series called Common Challenges. We're, we're talking about the things that uh, most of us experience in our life, but often it's our responses that can be uncommon. And um, so we're looking at some really intriguing passages of Scripture about things that lots of people experience, but we're finding new ways to respond to those experiences out of God's Word. And we are in uh, 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil, be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, have you come in peace? He must have had quite the reputation. Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If you were going to memorize like 10 verses of scripture out of the Bible, this should be one of the 10. It's just a huge difference maker in our lives. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, so they just stopped naming him because now it's getting embarrassing. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Well, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down till he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and a and handsome features. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went to Ramah. So I think we've all heard stories about a person who just happened to be in the right place at the right time and changed their life. You know, the, the young lady who was in a dance class and the right person walked in a talent scout from the entertainment industry and now they have their movie star or someone spotted in a pizza place or a cafe and we often wonder i wonder what it would have been like if maybe i was in the right place at the right time what kind of trajectory would my life have taken and a lot of us feel like we've missed certain opportunities sometimes by a little just a few minutes sometimes by a lot. What's fascinating about this story is that this story is about an individual who wasn't in the right place at the right time, wasn't even there, and God pushed the pause button until he got there because God's purpose for David's life was not going to be thwarted by a timing issue. It's a very important thing for us to realize. Sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves for timing, and actually it's God who brings our lives together and opens the doors for us. So we often think this way about our life, but this story begins with a person who's actually being rejected as king. His name was Saul. And when Saul was a young man, there were some things that were true about him. First of all, he had very striking features. He was very handsome. He was very tall. The Bible says he was literally head and shoulders in height above the average person. Uh, he looked what you wanted a king to look like. He was strong and he was powerful. Uh, but the problem for Saul is he'd gotten too tall on the inside. He'd always been tall on the outside, but now he got tall on the inside. Samuel would say to him at one point in his life, when you were small in your own eyes, God could make you a king. 
But now that you're this big on the inside, God can't do anything with you. Uh, when he made mistakes, he never admitted them. He, was, he became really good at blaming other people for what went wrong in the kingdom. And uh, if God gave clear di directions, he would pick and choose what part of the directions he wanted to abide by. And then on top of it all, he'd wrap himself in religion, not because he believed in it, but because he knew other people believed in it and he wanted to manipulate them. So God came to a conclusion that a guy like this is going to do more harm than good. And so he rejected him from being king of Israel. So that means a successor has to be in place. So he calls on Samuel to go and anoint the next king of Israel. And that's what I'd like to make this point, and that is God doesn't change his mind just because you are afraid. Samuel is very anxious about this. He knows enough about Saul to know that this guy is dictatorial enough and paranoid enough that if he hears I'm pouring oil on someone else's head, he's going to have me killed. He'll use the full power of his throne. And we know he's capable of this because we have insight into later stories on the kinds of things he did in his attempt to destroy the life of David. It is a common experience for people to assume that if I am afraid, then I'm exempt from doing what God is asking me to do. Maybe I've misunderstood, or maybe I'm not ready, or maybe I'm disqualified because doesn't God want people who are faithful instead of fearful? And so we tend to, to uh, exempt ourselves from obedience. But Samuel does something that's really important here. It's a way he asks a question of the Lord. And I think there's a lot of value in us learning to ask questions like this. Samuel did not say, I can't do that. Saul will kill me. Samuel said, how can I do that? Saul will come. He's asking for insight from the Lord. What are some steps that I need to be able to take? So if you are fearful, rather than saying, I can't, begin to ask God a series of questions that start with, how can I? It's not obvious to me. I don't feel like I'm ready. What are the next steps? And, and, and God gives uh, Samuel next steps. Very important. That actually leads us to this, and that is when you are unsure, begin with sacrifice. When you are unsure, begin with sacrifice. So he tells Samuel, look, go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem, and if anybody asks you, tell them you're going there to sacrifice. And that is what he's doing. But why is this important? Well, I think it's very important because anytime we're giving something of ourselves to something other than ourselves, something greater than ourselves, it makes a huge difference in our lives. It begins to be the thing that helps break down the, the uh, encrusted fear realities that we struggle with and that, that tend to paralyze us. And so, uh, in fact, everything that you enjoy in your life is a result of someone else's sacrifice. Everything we enjoy is a result of sacrifice. We're in, we're in a room today. You didn't pay admission to get in here. This was already here when you got, you did, how many are glad you did not have to build the building when you came in this morning? I am so glad for that. In this cold rain, that would have been a not good day. Someone else sacrificed so that this could be here. We enjoy freedoms and liberties in our nation that someone else sacrificed, right? Everything we enjoy is the result of sacrifice. And so it's a very powerful thing, and it, it, and it works. I mean, sacrifice is the only thing that works in our world. And so he tells Samuel, start with the sacrifice, and I will show you step by step what you are to do. So he comes and he offers a sacrifice, and when he arrives, everybody's uneasy. Evidently, he had a reputation. He could have a bad day once in a while. And so they say, do you come in peace? He said, I do. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. And then he invites them to participate in the sacrifice, and he tells them to consecrate themselves. So what does that mean? And it would be really cool if the Bible just gave us a list of the things that that means. And we don't know, but we can imagine. And what I imagine is, uh, clean yourself up, focus your thoughts, start thinking about God, and carve some time out in your day. In fact, in their, their case, carve out the rest of the day for this. We're going to set the rest of this day apart for what God wants to do. And so seven of Jesse's sons are present, 
and Samuel begins to look them over, and one by one, they're brought to the front of the room. Eliab, he's tall, he's strong, he is uh, just everything you would want a king to look like. And Samuel, sure, he, he actually says in his heart, he thinks this thought, this has to be the guy that God wants to anoint. And somehow, I, I don't know how exactly this happened, but Samuel could hear God's direction without anybody else in the room hearing what God was whispering to his heart. And God says, it's not this guy. And then he recalibrates Sam, Samuel and he says, I'm not looking at their height or their features. It's not a qualification or a disqualification because we're going to find out in just a little bit David was actually a handsome young man. The point is not how you look or how tall you are. God is looking for something else. Now, we tend to be appearance conscious. Uh, God looks at the inside. We tend to look at things on the outside. And uh, everybody came this morning. Let's just check how many dressed yourself this morning. Then you are responsible for what you are wearing. That's just true. And uh, 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 some of us are better at putting an ensemble together than others, right? Sometimes my wife looks at me and she will say, who saw you in that? <laughs> and then, then I'll think to myself, this is probably not the best selection choice, you know? Anytime I get a compliment on something that I am wearing, uh, my wife had something to do with the purchase of it or telling me that might be a good option for you today. And uh, anytime uh, you look at me and go, what the heck happened to him? <laughs> she had no input to that whatsoever. So we're constantly trying to put forward. We, we, we dress because there's something that we are presenting. And our, we are an incredibly image conscious society. And we're constantly not only presenting, but we're always looking at what other people present to us. And we make a set of assessments about them and assumptions that go with them. We, we begin to make a read on people. And our culture puts a lot of value in and pressure on this whole idea of managing your image. And what we hope is that if we, if we put forward the right and make the right impression, then I will be in the right room with the right people at the right time to get the stuff that I really want. And our whole culture is bent on this. And uh, by the way, that's not unique to the 21st century. Humans have always gravitated to this kind of thinking. And that's why Jesse's bringing his sons in order. And they're all cleaned up and ready to go. Eliab, big and tall. Abinadab, Shammah. These are the first three. After that, no names. And it's really easy to focus on the first impression thing. But there's a lot more than that going on in this story. It's not just first impressions. The youngest, we don't even know his name yet in the story. He's not mentioned. Even when he comes in, he's not mentioned. It is not until oil is poured on his head before we find out his name. The youngest is not invited by his own father or his own brothers, the people who knew him the very best. He's just referred to, when, when Samuel says, do you have any other sons? There's the youngest who's tending the sheep. It's a way of saying, that's all you need to know. That's why he's not here. He's, he's not anybody that should be in consideration. That should tell you everything you need to know about that guy. And Samuel's out of options at this point. He's gone through. God has said no to all of the brothers of David. And so Samuel just says, well, then we'll wait. In fact, he puts a little pressure on. Nobody's going to sit down until David is here. And so that puts everybody into hurry-up mode. And the planned meal is delayed. How many hate it when a meal is delayed? Don't you just hate that? I was a little kid in a pastor's home in Texas. And they, we had driven a long, long trip to get there. And they had dinner prepared for us. And I was starving. And they gathered us around the table. It was a beautiful home. And the food looked delicious. And I was very hungry. And I was, I was ready for a quick blessing and then dive into the food. 
And that's when the pastor and his family said, now we will have devotions. I said, what do you mean? And he opened his Bible, and he read a passage of Scripture, and then he explained it. And they all listened. And then they prayed. Not a little God bless this food prayer but about people in their lives, about the church, about stuff to be thankful for. And I'm sitting there saying, I am going to die right here. <laughs> They're going to have to pray a prayer to raise me from the dead because they are not feeding me. We don't like it when, we, when food is kept from us. We have an expression, don't we? We call it hangry. That's right, hungry and angry. But Saul's out of options. And as I said, those closest to David don't see what God sees, but God does see something. He saw something in David that his father didn't see, that his brothers didn't see, and that he didn't see himself. David saw himself just like everybody else did. Who are you? I'm the youngest. What do you do? The lesser jobs. That's just who he is. He didn't have some grand plan that he was hatching when he was sitting out in the wilderness keeping track of the sheep. What's interesting, though, is that while he was there in that mind-numbing kind of job, he did find ways to occupy himself, but not just to waste time, to actually make use of the time. So he got good with a slingshot. He would just practice. How many know wherever there are little boys and stones, throwing will occur? It's a mystery to me why all the rivers, creeks, streams, and oceans and lakes have not been filled already because you've never seen a little boy by the, by the side of any body of water that wasn't throwing stones into it. You'd think they would all be filled in by now. But he gets really good, really good aim with his slingshot. And he, he practices on a harp. There's no audience. The, the sheep don't care. No sheep is going to walk by and say, that was especially creative. That was... Or that was bad. No, it didn't. <laughs> yeah, they... See? Do you see what just happened there? You laughed, and then you were annoyed that you laughed. <laughs> I could tell. And, the, and, and he, he began to put his hand to writing some lyrics and making up some melodies. He found a way to make good use of time without wasting time. And this is a very valuable thing. If you feel like you don't see anything in yourself and other people don't see it in you either, it is so easy to go into hide under a rock mode and do nothing and learn nothing. And what I would tell you is just experiment a little bit. Try some things. See if it shows some passion, some interest, some intrigue in your life and learn it. You can make use of that time and you would be astonished how well God makes use of that later in your life. So what does God see? Well, it says that God sees your heart. What does that mean exactly? God sees your heart. My daughter just had an ultrasound uh, a couple days ago, and the quality of it was like they took, put a little high-definition camera right inside of her. You could see the face of this baby. And, and it was astonishing. So is God actually seeing a high-definition resolution of the organ that pumps blood through your body? Well, certainly he can, but I don't think that's what it's referring to. Some people think it's referring to emotions. That he sees you know, the emotions in, in your... Well, you know, honestly, I don't think it's that hard to see people's emotions either. I mean, how many can tell when somebody's angry with you? you know? When their face gets red and their tone gets loud and their vocabulary is reduced to words that only have four letters in them, that's a clue. That's a clue. Has anybody ever been out driving and had someone give you the one-finger salute? <laughs> it occurred to me, they are not saying, you are number one. That is not what they are saying. When someone is sad, when someone is, is hopeful, when someone is discouraged, these are things that we can tend to see. I don't think that this passage is saying, God can read your emotions. And it's true, some people can hide their emotions, but it's hard to do it consistently over time. I think what this is referring to is God sees your motives. What drives your actions? What makes you do what you do? Because you know what's true? Some people have done some horrible things for some really good reasons. They were trying to do the right thing and it just all fell apart in ways they couldn't fix. And there are other people that have done some really good things 
for some very bad reasons. And nobody can tell what your motives are except God. He knows exactly what's driving. In fact, what's interesting is sometimes we're even unsure of our own motives. It's a really useful thing to do sometimes. After you've been through a conversation or an interaction, just take a couple minutes. You don't have to do all day. It doesn't require a long session or anything. Just ask yourself, why did I do that? It's amazing how much information will start coming to your mind if you dare to ask the question. It's absolutely amazing. So God sees the motives. He sees the why of what we do. And what's true about David is that he's motivated to please God. This is an overarching motivation for him. He, just, he desires for God to be pleased. And when that's your main motivation, you can bring other or lesser motivations into submission to that motivation. You can bring correction to those things. You know, if, if you go out of here this morning thinking, well, all of my motivations need to be pure, good luck with that. You're a human being, and they're not all going to be pure. And if you think they are, you're delusional. All of our motives are not pure. We do things for hidden reasons and selfish motives. It happens all the time. And this is not saying that David was incapable of that. It wasn't saying he was incapable of sin. In fact, he's going to sin greatly in his life. But this is what was true. In every single one of those things, he was more concerned about pleasing his father than he was about protecting his own reputation. And so he would just do the right thing, even when people's opinions were being loudly proclaimed, the peer pressure was on. He was able to do what God wanted him to do in those moments. So God sees your heart, and God also sees your potential. He knows the raw material that he's invested in you. He knows what your abilities are, even if you haven't developed them yet. He knows what's inside of you because he's the one who put them there. And he also knows what doors are going to open for you. God could see David and he knew this guy is going to make a great king. Not because he's perfect, but under pressure, when other people are trying to manipulate and control him, he will consistently do the things that please me. And that brings us to this point. You are part of God's vision. God isn't trying to replicate someone else in you. He's not trying to make a cookie cutter follower of him so that we all look alike. We don't all look alike. We don't all have the same taste. We don't all have the same preferences. And that's not God's agenda. That to come together in unity is not about us all liking the same things and all preferring the same things. In fact, if all you do is hang around with people who like the world exactly the way you do, after a while you're going to get bored with that. Uh, if you hang around people who don't like the same things you do, you'll get frustrated with that too, but it won't be boring. It's just something to think about. But here's what I want you to see. He's created you to be one of a kind, not one of the crowd. And all of the time that we spend in our lives trying to be somebody else is wasting our time. It's not who God created you to be. God has a vision of who you are. And even if you haven't seen it, and even if nobody else has, you need to pursue that. The only way I know to find out that information is to spend more time with him. There, there are things that you and those closest to you have not yet seen in yourself, but God has a vision of that. And secondly... You are part of God's provision. There's an opening phrase in this chapter. It's interesting. It says, I have chosen one of his sons to be king. That's what God is saying. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. The translators actually modified that translation because the way it's actually written seems to be complicated and difficult to understand. The original language says, I have provided for myself a king. And so the translators go, well, it makes sense. He chose a king. That's what he's saying. But he's saying more than that. I have provided for myself a king. David is God's provision for the nation of Israel. They need a king. David is God's provision. You are God's provision to individuals and groups and organizations in your life. God has gifted you. He's given you and provided opportunities for you. He's prepared you in ways that may not make a lot of sense to you until later on in life. But there are things that he has done that has prepared you for what you need to do. And so you might not see it. That's all right. 
But in a moment, you can be called into something where it all clicks and falls into place. And you go, this is why I'm here. Now, it's interesting. Samuel anoints David with oil. And uh, if you've been around here very much, you know that we do this too. He anoints David with oil, and the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on him. So what is this? Some kind of magic uh, liquid that when you pour it on, it turns shepherds into kings? You know? If, if you pour this on yourself, you, you'll get rid of the bags under your eyes and the wrinkles will go away. Uh, when we anoint with oil, in fact, in the third service, we're doing a child dedication. We'll anoint the child with oil. Does, does that mean that this provides, like, maybe some kind of protection over the child magically? Or, or does it maybe keep them healthier? Or even better yet, maybe it will change them so they don't get in trouble? Uh, no, this is not a marketing campaign for a special liquid created by God. When we anoint people with oil, we don't think it has any magic properties at all. We don't buy it from a special place. We don't put it through a special process. When we anoint with oil, we're doing what Samuel did with David. And he's marking a point in time when he's saying, from this point forward, you need to give full attention to the purpose that God has for your life and less attention to your own agenda. That God really does have a plan and a purpose for you. And so when we pray for sick people and anoint them with oil, we're not saying, oh, the oil will heal them. Oil doesn't heal anybody. God is the one who heals them. What we're saying is, by this oil, we are recognizing that this person still has a purpose that needs to be fulfilled by God in their lives, and they need to be healthy in order to do it. So restore their strength and health so they can do what God has called them to do. That's the purpose of anointing with oil. It's not some kind of magic thing. So from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David, which leads me to my last point, and that is that God's empowerment is directly connected to God's purpose. He doesn't empower us to do what we want. He empowers us to do what he wants. You know, it's not tapping into a force so that we can manipulate it to our own ends. Something is activated by God's Spirit the moment that we begin to acknowledge God has an agenda for my life. And once you see that, you start seeing other things. You start seeing uh, opportunities that you didn't notice before. You start seeing giftings and abilities that you didn't realize that you had. You start seeing opportunities to make a difference in not only your life, but in other people's lives. And you begin to discern resources that God has actually placed and made available to you. Most people live their entire lives never really understanding why they are here. They get invited into rooms by people like Samuel. And God has something to speak into their life. And they decide not to go because they don't see something in themselves. And even the people who are closest to them didn't see anything in themselves. But God sees something in you. And that's worth knowing. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're on the front end of this journey and um, trying to figure out who you are. It's a great adventure. And uh, what I would tell you is uh, nobody gets it perfectly. We don't have a clear plan step by step where no mistakes are made. Requires faith to take steps towards something you're not sure about and un not completely clear about, but you trust the one who's calling you. That's the difference. And maybe for some in this room, you actually thought you had an idea about that, and it proved not to be true. I thought God was going to do this. I would tell you two things about that. First. It's possible that we misunderstood something God was trying to communicate to us. Maybe somebody else said it and we thought that was God speaking. The other thing I would say about that is your life's not over yet. You don't know how God or when God or where God will bring that to pass, but 
You'll never find out if you just give up on it. So Father, every one of us have a call from you, a purpose, a reason to be here. I ask that you would help us discover what that is, not because we figured it out on our own and not because someone else saw it in us, but because you see what no one else sees. And that makes all the difference. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand together this morning.